for coming to our presentation of our studio work. Um, uh, today we're going to be presenting on our examination of barrier island communities and different approaches uh, they might take to combat this huge question of sea level rise. Um, and before we get into that actual presentation and deliverables from the semester, I want to give a little bit of background about who we are, who our class is. So this studio is a facet of the Rutgers Coastal Climate Risk and Resilience Program, which brings together graduate students across numerous departments and schools at Rutgers to combat these questions of resilience broadly um, and particularly in coastal communities. So um, how we do this, uh, C2R2, um, Coastal Climate Risk and Resiliency, has adopted a particular research approach called a transdisciplinary research approach. Um, and this differs from multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary in the fact that um, it doesn't just involve multiple disciplines working together within academia, but also extending outside of academia to the communities that the research might affect. So engaging stakeholders, engaging, um, in our case, township employees, et cetera, um, is really important to this transdisciplinary research method. So some goals for our studio that we set at the beginning of the course. Um, the first one is to explore opportunities that there are existing to address climate change within barrier island communities and specifically our study site community, which I'll introduce in a bit. The second was to support and protect coastal community cultures. Um, and second was to develop resilience communication strategies for the diverse populations that live in and visit coastal communities. Um, and just an outline of our presentation that we'll be giving. Um, first, we'll give a background to our study site community. We'll present the location, um, demographic trends. We'll look at different land use and real estate changes that have occurred, um, uh, infrastructure development, and assorted uh, environmental and cultural resources available to the community. Then we'll look at current issues um, in the community that uh, consist of sea level rise, storm surge and flooding, and safety and evacuation procedures. Um, we'll examine existing community assessments that have been done, and this includes getting to resilience questionnaires, community vulnerability assessments, and a master plan re-examination. And then we'll uh, discuss our deliverables that we've developed over the semester, which are um, uh, a risk communication assessment, community engagement and activities recommendations, and uh, strategies to improve um, our community's website. So without further ado, we'll present Long Beach Township, New Jersey, which is a township on the southeast coast of New Jersey, um, residing on a barrier island, the barrier island being Long Beach Island. So barrier islands are incredibly unique coastal features that facilitate these really interesting um, uh, coastal communities, um, which make them a unique study feature. Um, so a barrier island essentially is a narrow uh, strip of land um, that uh, is created through sediment transport down the shore. The sediment becomes stabilized through numerous um, ecological communities that will be talked about later on in the presentation. Um, but really it provides a really rich uh, setting for coastal resources um, and beautiful location to put your town. So we see that a lot of the barrier islands, especially in New Jersey, are populated. And um, uh, Long Beach Island uh, is populated by numerous townships, including Long Beach Township. So Long Beach Township um, is unique because uh, not only does it span the entire 18 mile length of Long Beach Island, shown here, but you can see by the red squares that it actually is a uh, non-contiguous it has non-contiguous bounded units across the island. Um, and what I mean by this is that in between these red areas that indicate the um, boundaries of Long Beach Township are separate independent townships. So um, that creates a really interesting question for risk communication, for provisioning of services to residents, um, and also creating a cohesive township identity and culture. Like what does that look like when um, you have residents on the very south end and very north end of the island. So um, looking at the demographics can tell us a pretty interesting um, tale of uh, the, the evolution of Long Beach Township generally. 
So looking from 1960 to, th to 2017, we see that um, there was an increase in population um, until about 1980, and then the population started to plateau. So this is interesting because it differs from larger regional scales, such as county scales or national scales, which have seen steady increases. Um, and we believe that this plateau has to do with the nature of ex the township existing on a barrier island. There's limited land to develop, it's quite narrow, um, so build out happens really quickly um, and then you lead to this plateau. Additionally, um, looking to other demographics, we can see that from this bar graph here, over half the population is in an older age bracket. Um, so this raises questions of extra measures the township needs to consider in terms of uh, resilience and preparedness. Additionally, what we thought was really interesting is that there's more than twice the number of homes than there are year-round residents on Long Beach Township, or in Long Beach Township. So um, this kind of insinuates that a number of the homes are there for temporary residents or second homeowners, um, or maybe being rented, they don't have any residents at all, they're being temporarily rented to um, tourists and things. So what, does, what impact does this have again on that uh, kind of cultural identity of a community? And additionally, there's a low diversity um, in the population. The uh, year-round population is about 98% white. So uh, looking to the household median income maybe describes this, um, uh, this thought we had about second home ownership. So the household median income uh, in 2016 was reported at about $82,000, uh, which is quite high, and it's higher than, um, the, again, the larger regional scales. Um, and this may correlate with that uh, understanding that we have of many of the homes being second homeowners. <clears throat> so, um, to kind of understand, understand the context of these demographic changes, we can look to different land use and real estate changes. Here we present two different aerial photographs of uh, just one section of Long Beach Township. So in 1930, um, you can see kind of the areas of development, these squares here, and this is the beach, this is the bayside. Um, and by 2018, now, it's completely built up. You can see the difference. Um, it kind of just, uh, uh, corresponds to the um, population plateau that we saw in that graph. Um, and so how is this buildup occurring and, and what kind of structures are being um, zoned for and being, and being built? We can see this is again just one section of the township shown in a zoning map. Um, and there's one main road here called Long Beach Boulevard that we'll introduce in a bit. Um, and uh, just adjacent to Long Beach Boulevard, we have area zoned for commercial land use, but beyond uh, just this area adjacent to Long Beach Boulevard, we have zoning for primarily um, single family housing. Um, and this is just another uh, section of the township shown in that zoning map, and we see the same trend. Um, just again along that main road that bisects Long Beach Island um, is commercial zone, and all the rest is uh, zoning for single family housing units. So that really does result in um, commercial real estate and services being clustered in certain parts of the island and in one central location on the island. Um, uh, so looking at a trend of building permits um, is fairly interesting, particularly in regards to the occurrence of Hurricane Sandy in 2012. So we can see a drastic increase uh, in the um, in the provisioning of building permits for one and two family houses on Long Beach Island. Um, and this makes sense because a hurricane came, people's houses got damaged and they need to build new homes. But obviously uh, there's more to this story. And this trend here correlates with an increase in median uh, house listing price, um, which was reported in 2017 of $930,000 for uh, the median house listing price on Long Beach Island. Um, so there's questions in terms of who is getting access to these building permits. And um, it's, again, maybe individuals of a higher socioeconomic bracket. So what does this do to families that have been there for generations and have uh, uh, longstanding histories in the region? Um, additionally, it corresponds to a trend of an increase in outside investors, people from uh, the larger Ocean County, New Jersey, and even New York City regions coming and building homes to rent out to tourists. Um, and at, in the same moment that there's an increase in development on Long Beach Township, there's um, increased recognition of the risk of sea level rise. 
And we can see that uh, in a report um, performed by the Union of Concerned Scientists, they use Long Beach Island actually as a case study to indicate uh, that there will be a number of homes at risk of chronic inundation. Chronic inundation being defined as experiencing 26 at least floods per year. So what does this have to do with, uh, uh, if we see a larger number of more valuable homes, what might this um, mean for insurance rates and things that the township has to take into account uh, as they move forward? So getting into the infrastructure that's available um, in Long Beach Township and on Long Beach Island, uh, there are limitations due to the nature of it being a barrier island, such a thin uh, and narrow strip of land. Um, there is only one major road on Long Beach Island generally and in Long Beach Township. This map shows the areas of Long Beach Township highlighted in red, other townships in gray. This is Long Beach Boulevard, which spans the 18 mile expanse of Long Beach Island. Um, and in addition to the one main road where services are clustered, there's also one bridge on and off the island called the Manahawkin Bay Bridge. Um, so we will talk about evacuation a little bit later on in the presentation, but immediately there's you know, risk involved in having um, only one, one option to get people on and off the island, and even worse, in a post um, event scenario when services are needed on the island, if there's some sort of damage to the bridge, um, this uh, raises a lot of questions. So because there is kind of only one route uh, to access the main parts of the township, a lot of, um, a lot of energy and expenses and thoughts are put into infrastructure to maintain the usability of this roadway and um, these different transportation options. And one of these is the stormwater systems. So kind of correlating to this increased risk of flooding and generally nuisance flooding. So this is, these, are flood, these are your everyday floods that, uh, that occur. Um, the township has been investing in installing uh, new stormwater pumps um, such as these three in 2017 to kind of combat the risk of nuisance flooding. So this is going to be an increasing concern um, and also an increasing uh, notion to communicate to residents of the township. And then, oh. What's this up? Hi, my name is Dominic and I'm going to be presenting to you the environmental and cultural resources that are located on Long Beach Island and the township. And we can separate them down into three major components, and this is kind of just an overview of barrier islands in general. First are wetlands, or salt marshes. They're located in low-lying back bay areas, uh, highly vegetated, largely wet land, that is actually considered to be one of the most productive uh, habitat in the world. It harbors a lot of uh, fish, a lot of wildlife and a lot of plants, uh, at, and it has um, lots of vegetation, and it also serves for humans as largely water filtration, a storm protection, and flood mitigation. The second are beaches, and beaches are also uh, when I when I say beaches, I specifically mean dunes, uh, such as this. Not really the sand on the shore, but mostly the highly vegetated areas that are protected normally. And they are the fastest decreasing land uh, habitats uh, currently today, largely to sea level rise or human activity. And they have a lot of, uh, a lot of bird habitat, such as snow owls, black skimmers, and piping plovers. But they also have a lot of low-lying uh, grass, uh, which not only helps its biodiversity, but also helps uh, maintain and shape the dune structure. And that is important for flood and wave mitigation uh, considering that humans are defended by uh, dune structures with rising, uh, rising sea level. And the final one are oceans, which is probably the largest one. It's not really on the island, but it's right next to the island. And they contain uh, a lot of uh, fish and mammals. Uh, the, uh, a lot of them are known as uh, striped bass, uh, dolphins, sharks, uh, tuna, just, na just to name a few of the, the large ecosystem. And they're also uh, onshore, near sh uh, like I mentioned before, the onshore sand contains a lot of turtles, uh, horseshoe crabs, and shellfish. But this space is also occupied by human activity. And 
people come to the shore to experience the tourism. And some of that is surfing, some of that is sunbathing, or just uh, fishing, uh, parasailing, or sailing, or boating. You, you can name so many things that people want to do in Long Beach Township. And that really shapes the, the cultural identity that, that brings people to Long Beach Township. But there's also a uh, part of tourism, an ecotourism, that can be associated, and that's largely with people visiting uh, the marshland or the, the protected beaches for bird watching. And there are many osprey nests or, or migrating birds that you can observe from afar. So now, now that we've set the stage, I'm going to go into the current issues that Long Beach Township and its neighboring municipalities have to deal with t today, more maybe in the last, we've realized in the last 20 years and into the future. And the first one I really want to start with is sea level rise. And sea level rise is, is kind of the least, the least subtle of the, the issues that it has to deal with. And it's because it's kind of masked behind all the other, other issues that, sea level, uh, that Long Beach Township has to deal with. And I'll, get, I'll just get into that uh, later. But uh, a lot of the blame is put on the, the byproducts of sea level rise. But sea level rise is kind of a sleeping giant that will that can overtake Long Beach Township in the far long term. And this is the sea level rise expected in Long Beach Township. As you can see on the graph on the left, this is the prediction of sea level rise. As we all, perhaps everyone in this room can accept that sea levels have been rising and will continue to rise into the future. But it is highly uncertain how much it will be. And scientists have, debate that, have debated that, but have concluded that they will continue to rise Estimates of sea level rise are highly uncertain, especially farther into the future. But you can see in some models that it is a, you can see a foot of sea level rise within the next decade. And you can see what that translates to on the tool on the right. And that is just a, uh, an image that's cycling through a foot of sea level rise on Long Beach Township using the NJ flood mapper tool. So what you'll notice is that once that goes back to zero and into one, you'll notice how much one foot of sea level rise affects the Back Bay area, mostly um, the wetlands, because those are low-lying areas. Those are the first to be affected by sea level rise, whereas the, the ocean front is, is more affected by the effects of mean high water level. So when we have sea level rise, it's not just the mean water level. It's also the mean high water level, or what I'll call is, is high tide. So, and you'll actually find it surprisingly that the high tide, a, a one foot rise in high tide, submerges the ocean, uh, the ocean, submerges the barrier island more than a two foot rise of mean water level on the island. So it's very telling of what kind of, uh, what kind of a sea level rise is happening. It's not really just the water itself, it's more of the cyclical flooding that is happening here. And I'll get to that in a moment. But I want to go, first, I'll just go into really quickly what sea level rise is affecting on the island. And it's, uh, it's affecting many things, but I'm just going to highlight three. And the first is the need for beach replenishment. Uh, and as we might be familiar with, sea level rise accelerates erosion. And erosion, uh, as it depletes the beach, it's starting to uh, flatten the beach profile. So this is one foot of sea level rise. And over the course of time, it really smoothens the dune, and that creates more vulnerability for oceanfront property and for residents more inland at, because wave action can penetrate through the dune and into the township. And this image on the left is the most recent uh, Army Corps of Engineer beach replenishment project, which was just completed this summer. The second I'll highlight is nuisance flooding, as I mentioned before, with the high tide mark going up. It's not only uh, increasing the amount of flooding, or the, the more instances of flooding, but it's increasing the amount of flooding they get. And these images are actually, you may not expect, these are actually two months ago, in October 2018. Uh, there's a flood event that happened, and there are locations where the township had to notify residents that they could not drive through. And lastly, probably the, the most profound one is the elevation of housing. And this is the most direct to residents because this was a decision that residents had to make whether they wanted to stay or go from the island. And this was largely a decision made after Superstorm Sandy in 2012. Uh, 
it's a decision. It, it's it's a decision that is largely beneficial to the homeowner, and it, uh, largely beneficial to insurance companies and municipalities. But it's also the most expensive. So it really changed the population that lived on the island and how much money they were willing to invest into their community. So now, as I mentioned before, sea level rise is kind of the, the sleeping giant, but these are the effects that are happening today, and it's storm surge and flooding, because sea level rise isn't really what's, ha like, you don't see Long Beach, Long Beach Township underwater, but it's mostly water that's coming and going very quickly, and that's having a large effect on the residents, and it's increasing the amount of hazards. But these hazards don't really come up individually anymore. They actually come up together. And one example I can give is in October, that wasn't any particular storm that happened. That was just a rainfall. But because of the increase in sea level rise, you're having uh, water that's staying in the street that cannot drain because the water level of drainage is level with this, the flooded water. And so it is a permanent inundation and has to be forced out with the new installation of pumps. So you are effectively multiplying the damage, increasing the amount of extreme water level events, and in the, in the event of a large storm, you're going to have significant well, wave impacts. And as I've, uh, as I've just noted, high tides can be 20% higher during a full moon, or what will be referred to as spring tides. And in the case of Hurricane Sandy, the storm surge was 11 feet higher than usual because of these overlapping effects. And it just takes one instance for this to happen, for everyone to realize how profound the damage is when most of the Atlantic coast is only within 10 feet of sea level rise. And this is a, uh, the events that happened in October prior to Hurricane Sandy. And you can see that Hurricane Sandy hit a maximum of 24 feet of wave height, but just a week later, there was a nor'easter that almost near, neared the level at 18 feet, which, which was still higher than the 10 feet required to flood it. So the flooding happened again with, without the dune system. And then you also notice here how closely, how dangerously closely, I would say, the spring tide approached the flooding levels again. So this is a, a problem that's ongoing. It's only going to get worse. And it's more than just a single storm. This is actually just a regular occurrence. And finally, I'm going to go over the safety and evacu evacuation uh, measures they have in place because Long Beach Township doesn't just ignore these hazards. They have uh, systems in place. Uh, the first is, uh, that I'll mention is the Nixle, and it is a messaging alert system that residents are encouraged to enroll in. Uh, if you're registered to the Nixle, you will, rec you will receive notifications of a flooding on a street or an event that is occurring, and they're tell residents whether to stay or stay home or to leave the island. The second are the the, these live flood camera feeds. That you, they're actually four or five online provided by Long Beach Township website. And they are actually placed in locations where there is frequent flooding. So in these orange boxes here, you can actually see uh, there's actually some water yesterday that is still there. And then you'll notice on this street corner, there's typically flooding here. And you can notice that the asphalt here is cracked. So this, it's, it's a sign it's not flooding right now, but it usually is. There are also wake ordinances in place, which are laws to protect uh, private property owners so that vehicles driving through the township don't splash water and cause damage to others. People can, and violators do get ticketed by police. And finally, there is, as you would expect, a flood warning system, which occurs when there's a large amount of flooding, such as this amount of flooding, or if there's a hurricane approaching. And those procedures would typically lead to an evacuation. Uh, and you'd probably expect police officers in emergency response to be driving around the township and uh, forcing a ma mandatory evacuation for residents, encouraging them for their own safety. But of course, as we mentioned before, there's only one non-redundant path, uh, Long Beach Boulevard, to the, uh, the Bay Bridge, which is, which is the reason why there's a lot of traffic. And there's also the notion that with all of the flooding that's happening regularly, uh, residents are desensitized to the flooding that happens and are or they have this, this false, false, excuse me, false sense of safety and they decide to stay back, which is stay at your own risk. And that is, uh, and the notion that if they leave, there is an uncertain period of time which they uh, are away and they don't know what, what is happening on their property. 
So, yeah, now we're going to community assessment. Okay, so I'm Johnny, and um, once we did sort of our own background research and um, identified some of the current issues plaguing Long Beach Township, we decided to go further and take advantage of some of the community assessments that have already been professionally done to see what they see as a priority issues and what are their recommendations for action items they could take and how we could sort of help the township along with some of those recommended action items that they've already discussed. So there's three um, assessments that I'll be talking about and they're all at sort of different scales. So the first one is the Getting to Resilience questionnaire. It's a planning tool that's a statewide program that can be applied to different uh, coastal communities. And um, it goes through an assessment of what's the, what are the vulnerabilities of the township, develops a plan through this questionnaire that the community leaders run through, and then they implement that plan. Um, a more regional assessment that we looked at is the Coastal Vulnerabil Vulnerability Assessment, um, which is a more regional island-wide rather than just the Long Beach Township. They went island-wide with this assessment, and they gave us um, some recommendations on outreach, education, and infrastructure for Long Beach Township. And then I'll talk about the Master Plan Reexamination Report, which is um, staying just within Long Beach Township. Um, and they have recommendations related to land use, um, open space preservation, uh, and sustainability. So the Getting to Resilience questionnaire. So this um, questionnaire and this process was developed by New Jersey's Coastal Management Program. Um, and it's a tool to assist communities to reduce vulnerability and increase preparedness. And they've actually handed this program off to the Jacques Cousteau National Estuarine Research Reserve. That's a mouthful. Um, and um, so the way the process works is that they um, gather numerous leaders, so it can be the town planner, the town engineer, the sustainability coordinator, various leaders within the municipality, um, involved in emergency response, and they work with an external evaluator from JCN ENR, ERR um, to see um, what are the issues, how can they plan um, for vulnerabilities. Um, and one of the great benefits that came with uh, the leadership of JCN ERR is um, uh, points through FEMA's community rating system, or CRS. And what that can do is through various actions, they can get the flood insurance premiums, um, reduced by up to 45% within their municipality. And so some of the long-term resiliency planning um, recommendations they gave um, were to take um, this GTR questionnaire process and update their municipal plans, strategies, and or ordinances in accordance uh, with what they talked about. Um, make sure to continue the commitment to uh, maintaining the wide dune system and how they suggested doing that is through yearly um, dune plantings to stabilize that dune system um, as it's one of their most valuable assets regarding storm surge and flooding uh, on the beach side. Um, consider returning heavily damaged properties back into natural open space through the Blue Acres program. Uh, that's a high priority as well and beginning long-term planning for sea level rise. In the short term they wanted to maintain the storm ready community status um, which is a National Weather Service designation um, identify sea level rise as a hazard for the township and make sure that future buyers are aware of this um, before buying it so they know what they're getting into and what the future of the island um, may look like. And include the benefits of natural flood protection in their um, outreach campaigns. So making sure that people are aware and kind of gearing up community support for these greener um, approaches to flood mitigation. And they also wanted to begin conversations about these future risks and hazards um, to keep the community engaged and aware of what um, threats are kind of making uh, their community vulnerable. Um, and just a little summary of how the CRS factors into their GTR process. So um, they currently are a, a class five shown here um, and it goes from 10 to one. And so they have a 25% reduction on their premium and some key areas where they think they could gain CRS points and decrease that premium even more is through open space preservation, increasing their regulatory standards uh, like bulkheads and setbacks, and floodplain management planning. And another way that they can gain CRS points, um, which we think we can really help them with, is through including more information on their website and social media pages and things like that. 
Um, now moving on to the coastal, coastal Vulnerability Assessment, or the CVA. So this was actually created by the New Jersey Division of Coastal and Land Use Planning, um, and it was given to the Barnegat Light Township at first. But after a bit of discussion, they decided that due to the interconnectedness of the resources along the island and um, sort of the pitfalls that can happen if you were planning as separate municipalities dur during an uh, emergency response, it would be best to do this island-wide. And so what the vulnerability assessment does is assess exposure for categories one, two, and three storms, as well as one, two, and three feet of sea level rise. And they look at the built, natural, and social environments on the island. Um, and they come up with a value known as the Coastal Vulnerability Index, which is an index value based on geomorphology, slope of the coast, the distribution of flood prone areas, the drainage system on the island, storm surge and erosion. So it's a complex model um, and it can be projected for multiple scenarios and time horizons. So here's an example of uh, year 2050 time horizon. Um, and you can see the areas of Long Beach Township are highlighted in black and they all are categorized of having, as having a higher CVI by 2050. So um, that means that the vulnerabilities are going to get much worse uh, by 2050, uh, as you would expect. So some recommendations from the CVA, they kind of were divided into two categories. So for outreach and education, they wanna make sure that yearly information is provided specifically to residents that may be um, reluctant to leave during a mandatory evacuation event. Make sure that critical information is accessible and understandable um, before, and it's provided before, during, and after an event. So not being uh, retroactive with disseminating this information, making sure to be preemptive. Um, and some target populations they indicated that um, they think they have a difficult time accessing are seasonal tenants, elderly residents with pets, and non-English speaking populations. Uh, and they also expressed interest in developing a coastal conference where um, leaders involved in the emergency response and um, construction, um, land use planning, things like that within the township could meet with local residents and local leaders to exchange ideas and um, just engage the community in this, um, in this process. So uh, moving on to their infra infrastructure recommendations, um, as we said, they want to continue investments in improving their drainage through stormwater pumps, um, modifying boat ramps so that they can be used during um, disaster events for rescue or cleanup, things like that. Commissioning offshore barges to be staged uh, offshore before a storm events to house the, uh, the first fleet of equipment that will go onto the island after a catastrophic event. And then things like raising critical infrastructure to the 500 year flood elevation and conducting projects and investing in projects to pro protect existing island and marshland. And I'll talk about uh, one of those projects in this next section. So lastly, the master plan re-examination report so this is the municipal document. Um, it was adopted in the late 70s, um, but per state guidelines, it must be updated every 10 years. And so the most recent, recent re-examination occurred uh, last year. And um, the issues addressed here um, were really broad, but some of the ones that are more relevant to what we're working on here are land use plan, recreation and open space, sustainability, and um, there was an emphasis throughout all of this document to coordinate with the adjacent municipalities as we said, they're very interconnected and the um, irregular distribution of Long Beach Township makes this important. So related to zoning districts and land use, they wanna modify ordinances to be more supportive of new businesses. So because property value is getting so high, um, many commercial um, buildings are being torn down and replaced with single family homes. And so by modifying ordinances to be more supportive of smaller housing above commercial uh, buildings, things like that, you can encourage um, more investment in the economic and commercial side of the town. Continuing enforcing uh, bulkhead ordinances um, to higher elevations and merging redundant zoning districts, which includes ensuring setback ordinances are appropriate um, for each area. Regarding recreation and open space, um, they want to support the acquisition of land for open space and one way they've done that and local residents have done that is by approving a open space tax, a local open space tax um, recently, which can, is expected to raise up upwards of $800,000 um, a year. 
and that can be devoted to numerous projects. One such project that they're pursuing funding opportunities for is Osborne, Osborne Avenue Park, where the new Marine Education Field Station is going to put, be placed, and that's a picture of the temporary station, and they're looking to upgrade that into a more permanent facility. And they are in the process of adopting the new public access plan um, for LBT and coordinating it with other municipalities. Um, now into some of the sustain sustainability recommendations they had. Um, related to future storm surge, they want to make sure crucial information about the dangers of storm surge, um, the way that tides and storm surge can um, compound to their residents and the importance of evacuating. They want to seek funding for the storm water pumps, raise infrastructure, and um, the group that is really important to them in terms of protecting existing islands and marshlands is the Mordecai Land Trust. Um, here's a picture of Mordecai uh, Island, um, which is on the bay side of Long Beach Island, and um, it's home to really important habitat, um, and it provides flooding mitigation to the bay side over uh, on that part of the town, township. Um, and related to sea level rise conditions, um, they want to consider building a public parking area, actually at a higher elevation, um, for when high tidal events are occurring because it's gone to be such a problem. Um, continue monitoring sea level rise projections yearly and um, screening any development um, with regards to those projections. And again, prioritizing coastal lands um, by acquiring storm prone properties. So that leads us to our recommendations. Oh, yeah. My name is Zoe Kitchell. Uh, so from our research on Long Beach Township itself, and then also looking at information about a number of other barrier islands and coastal communities uh, around the United States and also other countries, and then also using a lot of resources provided in the reports that Johnny was just talking about, we came up with a suite of recommendations to provide the township going future, going into the future. So our main findings of our research were that uh, this township is incredibly diverse, both um, demographically in terms of who's visiting it over the course of the year, and then also just it's such an interesting natural space to work with. And so how can we use those different types of diversity as strengths, but we have to make sure that we're tapping into all those different types of the diversity that's present. And so what we found the most opportunities within and where we felt like our skill set was best suited was to improve the uh, communication strategies that the township usually currently utilizes, uh, specifically by developing a suite of more resilient communication strategies. And so our first step was that we had an idea of what different strategies the township currently uses, but we wanted to get a more structured and even quantitative understanding of what is happening so far. And so we performed a risk communication assessment in order to better understand what strategies are currently being used, what groups they're reaching, and how are they reaching them. So this table gives you an idea of our process. Uh, on the top are the different communication strategies, um, ranging from beach bed sales to uh, different flyers and billboards. And then here on the left-hand side uh, are the diversity of different people that those commu communication techniques are aiming to reach. And so what we found by looking at the reach of the communication is that while the current strategies are reaching full-time residents and part-time residents quite well, it's not reaching as well towards like smaller groups within the community, such as schools and clubs, and then also more vulnerable members of the community, such as non-English speaking members of the community and also the elderly. So the second thing we looked at was the timing of communication. So Again, here on the top, we have the different communication strategies. And here on the left, we have the timing of the communication, both in terms of when it happens and then also in terms of how regular that communication is. So what we found was that while there are a lot of communication strategies that specifically are aimed for after a emergency event such as Hurricane Sandy occurs, there are fewer communication strategies directed towards the before or during period of those events. 
looking at venues of communication. So where in the community are we able to use these communication strategies to reach the members of the community? We identified a few areas here on the left uh, where they we might be able to engage in communication. And then on the right, again, we have our different modes of communication. And what we found was that the online platform currently has the most diverse amount of information on it. But what we saw at the same time was that although super effective, although we know that online platforms are really effective, they're also probably reaching a narrow portion of the community and likely not the community members that we identified as vulnerable. And then last but not least, we also looked at the diversity of topics of communication, specifically looking at those three primary subjects that Dom was talking about earlier, uh, evacuation, flooding, and sea level rise. And Dom talked about this a little bit earlier, but it was confirmed with this analysis that while most of the communication strategies do address flooding in some context at some point, sea level rise and evacuation are spoken about much less. And so because we identified this online platform as an incredible resource for us to communicate with community members, we started with uh, the township's online and social media presence. Uh, and we also took, the, took this challenge on because uh, People within the township specifically said that this is something that they could use help with. So here on the left, uh, I know you can't see too far here, but this is just to get general impressions. On the left, we have the current web page. On the right, we have the suggested web page. And overall, our goal was to streamline important information and move important information, especially in regards to flooding, sea level rise, and evacuation to the top of the web page. Because before we found it was largely hidden within the web page. So this is just the top portion, a quick look of what it looks like now. This would be a rough uh, drawing of our recommendation. Uh, first of all, the most important part is that there was not a very obvious menu bar at the top. So we recommend that a lot of those important issues such as flooding and insurance information and community events are all moved right to that top bar for easy accessibility. We also noticed that Despite the immense diversity that I talked about that's present on this island, the uh, image at the top was just a picture of the, municipal, of the municipal building. Great picture, but we thought that it would be better to have a cycling sequence of images to give people a better impression of the overall characteristic of the island, and specifically the township. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this, but this is just to show that this was further down on the web page, and you can see that like hidden within these uh, different buttons are actually really amazing information sources, such as the traffic cameras that Dom was talking about earlier um, and different information about flood information. And none of this was particularly accessible before. So we moved this all up and we replaced this with a really neat interactive map. And this allows people to come to the website and in a very visual way, see where different events are happening, see where they can access emergency services. If they're totally unfamiliar with Long Beach Township, they can get a better idea of where it exists in space. And what's really neat about this is that we integrated the different traffic cameras actually into this map. So they can see where the traffic cameras are on the island. And then through a quick link, uh, they can see what's going on there right now. Not much going on there right now. <laughs> Um, and this is the bottom of the web page, and again, not much to show here, but uh, a lot of this information has been moved to the top. But we do, as you can see here, have a link to the Twitter page, and we really want to maintain that presence. And so we haven't updated too much at the bottom other than moving the map up and maintaining that connection to the social media page. So in addition to improving the actual website, we also wanted to improve uh, the social media strategies that the township is using. Already they have a really comprehensive social media strategy, but what we did notice is that, as I spoke of and as Dom spoke of earlier, they do speak of flooding a lot on their different social media platforms, but less so about what's causing that flooding. And so one recommendation is that the township integrates information about sea level rise and climate change and uh, evacuation steps um, 
onto these social media pages and also making it accessible before the actual like, emergency or hurricane or flooding event is happening. So one strategy for that would be linking the social media pages to like, other pages with really good information that might lessen the burden of actually coming up with data uh, to the people in the township. So this could be the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, um, linking it to information about Nixil, the uh, emergency communication platform that Dom was talking about, um, or the National Weather Service. We also noticed that surprisingly, the Long Beach Township Police Department has a really active social media presence. So finding a way to integrate those two uh, different sources of information could be a good step. Um, also, a number of us spent a few weeks in central Jersey this summer and we interacted with the folks at the New Jersey Coastal Coalition. And unfortunately, we were not able to attend, but they do frequently have these uh, tidal flooding talk series that they stream live on their social media outlets. And we thought that either it would be neat if the township could integrate these uh, series of interviews onto their social media pages or make them uh, like stream it to a place on Long Beach Township and encourage people to come and watch. Or they could, if they're feeling extremely motivated about talking about how these issues directly affect the township, they could start a uh, different type of interview platform um, streaming channel of their own. Uh, other deliverables that we're offering to the township uh, are uh, slide decks. Some uh, I won't show here, but are uh, educational slide decks that members of the township leadership, the, the leadership of the township um, could bring to an event to share information specifically about how other barrier islands have dealt with sea level rise and what strategies they're using to adapt. Uh, and also about a number of more detailed uh, information about the reports that we talked about earlier. Um, but two things I will talk about is that we've developed a graphics suite uh, and these are just two examples that would be included, one about Nixel, one about um, how to be ready for a flood. And these would be uh, streamed on the social media pages or on the website. It could also be on the public television station with the idea of just getting the ideas of sea level rise and evacuation and also flooding just more common in the everyday life of the people living there, um, just so they become more familiar with the issues. And then similarly, we noticed that there is a lot of information available at the township building, uh, but there isn't a particularly easy way to update the platforms in which it's being communicated. So we've also developed a similar slide deck um, that could be used on a screen right as you walk into the township building. And this could include events that are happening in the township, so it would be updated frequently, but could also include information about flooding and sea level rise. Um, and then also talking about the Marine Education Field Station uh, opening event that Johnny was talking about earlier. So in addition to improving the online and social media platforms, we also realized it was important to find creative ways to communicate with the people who are not going to be going onto the website. So that's where comes the community engagement and activities. And the first step that we took was to identify groups within the community that we could tap into that already have strong roots in the community. And so we uh, compiled a really diverse list of different groups from scout troops to churches to nonprofits uh, and came up with innovative ways of how they could bridge the gap between the township wanting to share information and getting it to communities that may not be getting it currently. And so one other thing we thought a lot about was the fact that our communication strategies for the full-time residents are gonna be much different than the communication strategies for people coming occasionally or maybe coming for a few weeks out of the summer. Uh, so first we thought about the full-time residents. Um, opportunities that they present are the fact that they are likely there all through the year and they're likely very ingrained in the community. Um, on the other hand, this is probably the group that encompasses our most vulnerable populations. And so how can we find innovative ways to reach out to those people who are there all year round, but probably not benefiting right now from the communi communication strategies. 
So we thought about uh, that communication with this group should provide tools to prepare for emergencies, promote sea level rise awareness, uh, and then also integrate this information into everyday activities that they are participating in anyway. In contrast with the part-time residents, in terms of opportunities that they present, uh, they participate, although they're there for a shorter period of time, often they're very involved with seasonal events. It's also typically predictable where they're going to be on the island, and so that could make it easier to communicate with them if we know that they're gonna be at fairs, or they might be at the farmer's market, or they might be at the beach. Um, on the other hand, they likely came to the island to have fun and perhaps don't want to hear about the future of the island and sea level rise. So finding a way to make, remind them how important they are to the infrastructure of the island and the future of the island and providing them opportunities to engage with the information that could be fun. So for example, like a activity for children at the beach, which would attract the children, but then inevitably the parents would come as well. So thoughts here are how to be quick and integrated about the information that we're sharing. Um, also emphasize that they are also important members of the community and definitely including pertinent and very up-to-date information on flooding and uh, weather. So our first activ specific activity that I'm gonna talk about today um, is the FEMA's High Watermark Initiative, which has been in place uh, in many places across the country, including Monmouth County. And the idea is to put signs up that remind people of what it looked like during a recent event, such as Hurricane Sandy, and where that high level mark, high water mark went to, just to keep it in people's minds of just how bad it was. But then also for people who are perhaps new to the community, reminding them that this is an area affected by these issues. This is a great opportunity to engage a lot of members of the community. You can engage kids and business owners and come up with creative ideas of how to launch uh, the inception of these new signs. Uh, also, the design of the signs is flexible. They could be incorporated into that process. And then FEMA also recommends that when you do release these signs, you make it into a big event and inv invite many community members. So this might be a good thing to uh, do perhaps in the summer when you have a bigger community on the island. And then the second thing I'll talk about is that in terms, again, of reaching communities that perhaps are more difficult to reach, we thought a lot about trying to narrow in on the part-time residents when they are going to the beach. So one idea was to integrate information with the actual beach badges, whether that be through an informative flyer that's also available or some type of envelope that they would put their beach badge into. Uh, we have also developed uh, some magnets that could be available for people at the township office or could be sent out to new residents or could also be available at the Beach Badge Center. And so these are just two visuals of the magnets that we have provided to the township to distribute as they will. Uh, we have printed them on magnets and they look really good. So here on the left we have uh, some numbers for emergency management across the entire island, but emphasizing the township. And then here on the right uh, is a storm safety checklist. So again, disseminating the information before they actually need it. So overall, we've included a number of different deliverables within our package, including a final report and a number of actual physical deliverables, uh, including also the slide decks that I was talking about earlier. And we hope that these tools will uh, help the people that are uh, already doing such a good job communicating these issues uh, find more uh, diverse or innovative ways to integrate the information uh, within the ways that they're already doing that successfully. And so in conclusion, uh, we've implemented, we hope to implement some communication strategies that are designed to engage these really diverse populations on Long, in Long Beach Township. Uh, but we also wanted to emphasize how important it is to reevaluate these strategies over time. And so future research would involve looking at whether these strategies have been successful uh, and if they have, improving upon them. And if they haven't, definitely improving upon them. Um, so engaging in adaptive management strategies. Uh, and th with that, we would like to thank everyone at the township who has been so helpful in collaborating with us in terms of finding like, where our skill sets would help them the most. 
Um, and then also definitely thank you to the Coastal Climate Risk and Resiliency Program and the Blaustein School for their support. And we would be happy, anyone would be happy to answer any questions you have. Yes, Clint. Um, you had an interesting uh, set of slides that was uh, when you sort of, I think you called it a, a communication assessment. Sort of. Yes. I believe there is one elementary school. Two elementary, two elementary schools. But, trying to merge them. but they are trying to merge them. Um, there is not a elementary school in Long Beach Township specifically, but there is one. There are two on the island. Is that, that was such a glaring gap here. Yeah, it is really interesting. It'll be interesting to see if um, with this new like mobile education center, whether there will be a collaboration between that center and the schools on the island, but. Have you had a chance to see whether uh, any of the sustainable Jersey um, school points and credits might, might address some of these resiliency issues and whether this town is part of sustainable Jersey? I have not looked into it, but that's they a good point. They are part of sustainable Jersey, yes. And um, we had discussed um, as part of this that curriculum that was developed with the ecological solutions, which is part of Sustainable Jersey um, schools program, that they could use that even though they're not, even though they don't have educational buildings, facilities in their area, they obviously, all of their children go to the high school. Yeah. And that they could use the Sustainable Jersey for schools actions. Um, and promote them to the high schools to be looking at that. And the students would be doing the work on the island, but they go off island to Stafford, Stafford Township. And um, the other one was the library, which is, again, is there a library? Again, not in Long Beach Township, but yes, on the island. I believe there are two, two libraries. Again, seems like a plate, and I think some of that disconnect is from the fact that these the strategies we are talking about are specifically like from Long Beach Township, and so perhaps like schools and libraries, if they're not within the township, there's a bit of a disconnect. But I think another one of our big findings was that it's such a unique community with the fact that it's scattered in between these other communities, and so any opportunity to like, bridge those gaps. Uh, would really help enhance their overall communication strategy. And then, um, I have one other, it's more of a general comment, and that was, I'm trying to, I was trying to figure out who you were talking to. You know, um, uh, it, it, uh, like earlier, in one of the earlier speakers was, taught, it was almost like you were describing a hypothesis wouldn't want to be telling people that they were part of a hypothesis test. And just more generally, did, who's your audience, or who are your audiences for, for this presentation? For this presentation, I think yeah. the audience was um, the general public, or like members of the Blaustein community that might be interested in this sort of work with townships. As opposed to the residents of that town. Yes, yeah. Correct. This, this presentation is not, so we are developing a presentation for the township specifically that would be different, that is structured differently. Yeah, but that's a good thing to keep in mind as we do that. I should probably, before I ask my question, introduce myself, kind of, kind of sneak myself in here. I'm a faculty <laughs> in the Department of Landscape Architecture. 
And I've been part of the very early discussions about this program, so I was really excited when this email came around about the presentation about it. I thought, okay, what comes out of it? So that's why this showed up uh, in my spare time. And, um, and I have learned a lot, really a lot from you guys here. Yeah. And I felt like uh, addressed as audience because it was very much an academic presentation for an academic audience. So I felt very comfortable with it. And you definitely want to change this when you go to the community because you're talking very much about people and not with people. Mm -hmm. So I have two things that I really struck with. Mm -hmm. Number one, and I'm, I may be probably a bit strange the way I come down to around now, is so you're caring about the rich white people who do have enough money to use to use this beautiful location for uh, for a use that's probably not suitable. So so why do you live here? So <laughs> it's it's, uh, it's it's you know it's going to be flooded. You know, it's like any, you showed all these pictures of um, nuisance flooding, so it's the, it's the most unreasonable place to build a house. So why do you live there? So, I think generally it's not our call to go to the community and tell people where they can live and can't live. That's not our call as researchers or um, yeah, generally our call is academic researchers to say that. We can examine the township and, and recommend ways to kind of navigate that and adapt, but ultimately that's a community decision and an individual decision. We, we did fairly significant real estate research and um, without question, the trend is for newer, larger, um, housing to be developed. Um, empty lots <coughs> are being built up. Um, the Bayside medium value was over a million dollars. And if the people are going to be there, which they obviously are, and are in increasingly putting more development on, then how can we at least ensure their safety or their evacuation? There, there was not, so it's, the purview of the studio was not to convince them not to be there, but to help the municipality deal with the fact that they are increasingly changing their demographic and, and how to address those issues. Right, and I, I totally get that point. I, I really loved your presentation because I, I learned so much about that town that told me I was good, how uh, like how the demographics are changing or whatever, what was for me new and kind of shocking that at a place which is really unsuitable for housing where you think about raising and because of the, that because of the higher insurance cost and the higher cost of building something, it is the rich demographic that does it. That, it, that a place that is unsuitable for housing becomes more desirable and becomes more expensive. And that is when you think about how we manage land use in the state, about how the like how how, how the Blousting colleagues who are much more experts than, than us managing it. Uh, so how we manage land so, so the question is, is market value a good way of managing land use? And I think this is what you kind of discovered and, and I'm saying like as you even as you, you take this position of okay, a researcher, I don't know what to do, but but as a researcher you, you, you're going to face a question that in the long term, maybe it's not. So, um, Dom, you did some of the barrier island research, I think. So we also, and all, almost everyone looked at some portion. We looked at Texas. Yeah. We looked at Louisiana. We looked at North Carolina, South Carolina. I think we did Florida. Um, looking at different ways states are dealing with barrier islands. And in some cases, they're doing what you suggest, they're creating a new one, and they're only fish, wildlife, habitat. In other ones, they are coming back and allowing people to be in. And in some of those, 